All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon. Welcome to self regulated learners. This session is part of the DPI arts education teams SEL series, which is social emotional learning. And it's also part of our making lemonade series. Just a quick note that we will be recording this webinar and posting it to our webinar archive. You can also click on the link to the bit.ly that we shared in the chat. And it's also posted at the bottom of your screen and you can follow along the slide deck or access that later. If you wish, it will also be sent out to you in emails later today. Okay, and then just take a moment if you would and notice the graphics at the bottom of this screen. Um, they are to take you to our website. So if you click on that little splash, um, it's a clickable link for you to go to our Google site homepage. This page contains updates of um, and links to all of our upcoming webinars and as well as our webinar archive where you can access previous recordings of all of our um, previous webinars that we've had. You can also sign up for our listserv on that and you would get our regular newsletters um, to find out about more information of any additional webinars we have coming up. Okay. I'd like to take a moment and we'll just introduce ourselves. My name is Sayward Grinley. I'm the dance and visual arts consultant for DPI. I just started in this position at the end of May, so it's been a really new and quick introduction virtually for me. Transitioning from teaching dance in the college setting for the past eight years and public school teaching before that. Brandon and I work very closely as an arts education team and both have extensive experience in all four arts areas, along with remote and virtual teaching and learning. I'll now turn it over to Brandon to introduce himself to you. Hi, I am your music and theater arts consultant. And um, as Sayward says, we do work together as a team, but I will be available to anybody who is um, looking to partner and um, have any specific questions about the music and theater mm -hmm. arts standards. Thanks, Brandon. Um, and although she is not here with us today, our section chief for social studies and arts education is Dr. Lori Major Carlin. She's a previous theater educator and researcher in the field and believes in staying solutions focused. So she brings a wealth of knowledge and encouragement to our team. And lastly, we are very excited to introduce our guest speaker for today, orchestra director at Durham School of the Arts, Matthew Holt. Matthew's gonna tell you a little bit about himself. Hi, everybody. I am Matthew Holt, the co orchestra director at Durham School of the Arts in Durham. Uh, I am uh, very excited to be here today and talk about um, our students, uh, our uh, student regulated learnings, and teach you a little bit about, the, well, what we're going to do in this upcoming, uh, you know, COVID situation coming into the fall. So I have, I've taught at Pankhurst High School in Moore County for the past five years, and I've just entered as my first year at Durham. Um, very excited for the new opportunities and uh, we're going to see what this year holds and we're going to go into this with a lot of passion, a lot of excitement. So I hope this webinar gives you some opportunities and some resources to help you on your way through this. Great, thank you, Matthew. Just a few housekeeping reminders that today's session is DPI facilitated. We do encourage your video, but it is not required. Feel free to use the chat for any questions or thoughts or ideas that you have, but we do try to stay on topic. Brandon or I will respond to the chat. Please also let us know if you're having any technical issues that we can try to help you with. While we know everyone is eager to plan and figure all of this out for this year, we try to keep the discussion to solutions focused or with the growth mindset that we encourage in all of our students. Please remember to stay muted during the presentation unless you are specifically unmuting for a question so that we do not get any background noise and we can all hear the presentation. We do have it on closed captioning to help you follow along, but if for any reason you cannot hear or get your sound to work, remember that we are recording and you can always go back and watch the recording for anything that you've missed. 
If we notice that you may have accidentally unmuted or we're hearing some feedback, we may send you a gentle note in the chat to let you know. You can take a moment and notice the features on our WebEx program here, which is our state mandated program to use for our webinars. You'll notice where you can mute, find the chat box and change your view layout. So again, let us know if you're having any issues, but this will be the slide that you can come to to find all of those features. Today, we will give you a brief overview of arts education in North Carolina and an introduction to social emotional learning, the castle competencies and specifically self management. We will then move on to part 3, which is the main content of our session and finish with a closure will you where you will be given a link to a survey to complete in order to get your certificate and get credit for today's session. One more reminder that you can access the slide deck to follow along at the bit.ly that's at the bottom of the screen. Today's webinar goals are to gain confidence in teaching the North Carolina essential standards for arts ed remotely, develop an understanding of self-regulated learners, tools and transfer of learning for creating lessons in virtual or blended instruction to promote students to become self-regulated learners. We think it's important to remember that we are stronger together and that though we often are the only educator who teaches our subject in the building or district these days, um, we are not alone. So we need to make sure that we have others that are here to support us and on our team. North Carolina Public Schools serves 1.55 million students in 2,500 public schools across 386 public school units. In those 2,500 public schools, 7,026 teachers teach the four arts areas, dance, music, theater, visual art. Though the North Carolina General Assembly lawmakers create the laws and the State Board of Education creates the policies which impact your job, it is the job of DPI to create instructional resources to help you succeed in teaching your students. Brandon and I do not make any of the policies or decisions, but we are here to assist you in any way we can. This series has been specifically designed to help our teachers succeed when the decision making process is out of our control. Remember that you are not alone in this. We are also really excited and happy to share that the newly legislated arts high school graduation requirement has just come out for the first time ever. Every student in North Carolina will experience the arts, starting with those students entering grade six in 2022. In North Carolina, we teach within the comprehensive arts education framework. The three components of CAE are interdependent and all necessary. Arts education, which is that the arts are as core academic subjects taught by licensed arts educators. This includes dance, music, theater arts, and visual arts. Arts integration, that the arts are as a catalyst for learning across the curriculum, creating deeper learning experiences that support content mastery and the development of critical and creative 21st century skills. And arts exposure, exposure to quality arts experience offering, offered during and outside schools, such as artists in residence, visits to galleries, concerts, and performances. The responsibility to provide a comprehensive arts education is shared by many partners. It requires a collaboration of administrators, educators, artists, and community organizations to bring a full complement of CAE opportunities to our children. CAE, when implemented in all districts of North Carolina, will provide access and equity for all children to be successful in work and life. Please join us for our future webinars, which are posted here on this slide. Next week, we will be focusing on Google Classroom for Arts Education, where we will have district leaders and classroom teachers there sharing how they're using Google Classroom. We have one called Dancing Alone But, but Together, which is both SEL and remote learning focused. And then thinking outside the box with three visual arts teachers sharing how they have been making visual learning work for them in their classrooms. So these will certainly be ones that you won't want to miss. Very quickly, our partners at NCACDA have put together a virtual conference series that frankly looks amazing. Make sure you check out their conference. There are options for both members and non-members to attend. 
and NCMEA starts their free technology resource webinar this week. Um, though they are specifically tailored to music teachers, they're open to all teachers who might find the content useful. Please check their website for details. I'm gonna hand it over to Brandon now. First, I'm going to apologize if you hear any loud booming, there is a terrible thunderstorm coming through right now. So um, today we've kind of switched gears in our Making Lemonade series, and we're gonna talk about SEL. And if you are, um, are new to SEL, it's social and emotional learning. It's the process in which children and adults understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. Social and emotional learning, often referred to as SEL, enhances students' capacity to integrate skills, attitudes, and behaviors to deal effectively and ethically with daily tasks and challenges. Like many similar framework, CASEL's integrated framework promotes interpersonal, intrapersonal, and cognitive competence. There are five core competencies that can be taught in ways, in many ways across many different settings. Many educators and researchers are also exploring how to best assess these competencies. In November of 2019, North Carolina joined the Collaborative States Initiative through the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, also called CASEL, and formed the CASEL Collaborating States Initiative Team, also referred to as the North Carolina Social Emotional Learning Implementation Team. You can learn all about the way that they're implementing SEL um, at this link. As a result of this collaborative work, the North Carolina SEL implementation team began leveraging existing connections between the North Carolina standard course of study and the CASEL core social emotional competencies, which we'll see in just a moment. These document, or this document was adapted by from the insights, work, and experience of other CASEL collaborating states initiative teams in Massachusetts and with contributions from the staff at the Massachusetts <laughs> Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. They were expanded upon by the North Carolina Depublic Department of Public Instruction's K-12 Standards Curriculum and Instruction Division for use with the standard course of study. Specifically for the arts ed documents, we also partnered with A plus schools of North Carolina in the North Carolina Arts Council um, to provide tailored and exact examples for both elementary and secondary um, teachers of the arts. CASEL's widely used framework identifies five core competencies. Self-awareness and self-management are in orange and they pertain to the self. Social awareness and relationship skills in the green areas are skills for how to work with others. And responsible decision making in yellow is how we synthesize all of that information into action. The concentric blue circles around the outside are environments which envelop the student and can support their social and emotional learning. Recognizing these, we knew that to supporting or to further support our arts areas, um, we need to spotlight how easily the arts support social emotional learning. And our arts ed team with input from our friends over at A plus schools drafted quick reference posters for SEL plus the arts. However, recognizing the digital world that we live in, we decided to actually pivot and create an interactive castle wheel on our website. So I know it can be a little overwhelming to look at this picture, but if you go back to the original, then you can see that all it is is that these buttons have been overlaid. By the way, the um, rectangle on the right is a direct link to the posters, and all of the images, or the image in the middle will take you to the actual interactive picture. You can explore that image to learn more about how the arts and SEL intersect. The YouTube images will take you to a video highlighting the specific competency. D shares aligned ideas for dance, M for music, TA for theater arts, and VA for visual arts. Clicking on the words anywhere in the image will take you to descriptions for those core competencies or community elements. The images along the concentric blue circles are resources from our partner and community organizations. Research has shown that social and emotional development can be fostered 
and social and emotional skills, attitudes, and behaviors can be taught through a variety of approaches. They can be freestanding lessons designed to enhance students' social and emotional competence explicitly, teaching practices such as cooperative learning and project-based learning, which also promote SEL, the integration of SEL and academic curriculum, such as language arts, math, social studies, and health, and organizational strategies that promote SEL as a school-wide initiative that creates a climate and culture conducive to learning. Today, we're going to focus on one teacher instructional practice specifically in one core competency, and that is self-management. So here you can see the definition of self-management from Castle is the ability to successfully regulate one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in different situations, effectively managing stress, controlling impulses, and motivating oneself. The ability to set and work towards personal and academic goals. Who doesn't want a kid like that in their classroom? I definitely do. All right. <laughs> if you've been to any of our sessions, you know how much I really, truly love this instructional framework. I just want to remind everyone that SEL is explicitly designated as one of the seven design principles for remote teaching and learning. This means that it is considered a best practice and to spend time addressing SEL in the classroom and in the um, remote learning setting. This section is directly taken from that framework document and addresses how important SEL is, especially right now, given the current situation. Notice the red quote. Um, in the next to the light bulb at the bottom. Ensuring that students have opportunities to continue to see their place in our school community is imperative. Addressing SEL is not optional. It is critical to the support or to supporting our students and their learning. Um, just quickly, the arts ed team at DPI is working on several additional SEL webinars for you that will dive deeper into specific strands of the castle competencies through the arts. Our next one is, as Sayward mentioned, Dancing Alone, but together making it the best it can be on August 6th. We also have other things in the works with the North Carolina Symphony with social awareness, um, relationship skills with the Carolina Ballet, responsible decision making, creating a community. And um, you can see any of these webinars archived or the SEL sessions that we have already done by clicking on the link there that says SEL heading. So you probably have many questions and we um, just through our, our few presentations of this have some FAQs that we'd like to cover. Uh, NCDPI is providing support documents to help with the implementation and local school units will be able to choose whichever SEL program best suits their student population. Since there's currently no funding provided for this initiative, your school um, is sorry, if your school is already using a character ed or other SEL program, you are certainly welcome to continue using that program. Hyperlinked on this slide is Castle's guide to evaluating any and every av available program. This SEL movement is about supporting students and teachers. If you look back on the, um, the flyer from DPI, they are intent on supporting teacher and adult SEL as well. Uh, so, therefore, there is no plan currently to tie the NISI's evaluation instrument to any sort of teacher evaluation uh, or execution of SEL at this time. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce, again, Matthew Holt teaching us how to uh, capitalize on self-management through self-regulating learners' routines. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And let's see, let's do this as seamless as possible because I practiced. And the first slide on this is about practicing. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. Oh, okay, go away, there we go. Beautiful. All right, guys. So welcome. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in for this awesome presentation. I hope that you can, again, gain some really awesome things from this. And uh, I have I was uh, inspired by this, and I'm really excited to, to continue to uh, promote it in my classroom, and especially this year where students are going to be um, outside of our classrooms for some of us.
And sometimes in, sometimes out. Uh, it can really throw us different curveballs every single day. So these, uh, these tools are going to help you manage your students by managing themselves. So first, I want to start with a little, um, a little hook. So when I was a kid, and I was going through music school, and even before that in high school and middle school, I was told a lot of times to go practice. So I'd be saying, go practice your scales or go practice your music, go practice your arts, go practice your math, go do all that stuff. And I was a very poor practicer. I was very much like understanding how I can get through it. And it was never, it was probably never the best way to do it. And a big reason behind that was because I didn't really know how to. I didn't know how to manage my time. I didn't know how to practice. I didn't know how to approach each and every day. So if you look in front of you, you see I have four different memes up here. And my kids love memes. I love memes. They hate my memes, which makes me love them even more. So I'm sure that one of you, you, you totally relate to one of these. I'm a big J.K. Simmons fan. That's how I related a lot. But I also related a lot to number three. Or as I, maybe I can get through this and kind of absorb it at the very end. <laughs> so, um, if you would, uh, Brandon, do we have the poll going yet? The poll is not going to seem to work with the live streaming of Facebook. Yeah. So we can just have them put it in the chat. Or better yet, they can put on their videos and show us the number on their hands. Oh, that's awesome. Very Let's cool. See. So if you have your video up, throw up a number. Tell me which one you relate. If you don't, type in the chat. Let's see which numbers that you relate to most heavily. It'll be interesting to go through and see at the end um, who has what. So very cool. I see some ones. That's scary. Some threes, big three fan, big three fan there. Some threes, ooh, a two, very nice, very nice. Why am I not surprised that Linda would pick one? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that you see this and you relate to it in some way, shape, or form because you probably weren't sure how to approach practicing or you weren't sure how to label your day and go about each lesson as a student and reinforce your habits that you learned in the classroom. So, oops. let's do a little overview. So stay with me throughout this because I'm gonna do some talking. I highly encourage you to take some notes and we're gonna answer some questions at the very end and any clarification that you might need. I'll definitely do my best to help with that and we will, we will make sure we get your questions answered. But I'll overview of this presentation. So what is it? I'm going to define it for you. Self-regulated learning, the processes behind it. Remember, this is about learning. It's not necessarily the subject itself. This is to teach your students and teach them throughout non-arts and arts how to be effective learners. Next, what is it going to look like in your classroom? We're going to go through how to implement this successfully, each phase of self-regulated learning. And finally, we're going to do some stuff together. Working together, create examples, and we're going to show you some online organization and some wonderful resources that are going to be available for you. It's okay if you don't osmosis all of this information right now, because it's a lot. But we're always available to answer your questions. You'll see you'll have my contact information. If you need to reach out and ask a question, I'd be happy to, happy to guide you through it. So right now, I want you to go to the this mentee, and actually, I'm going to um, switch my screen share for just a second. Oops. I'm going to switch my screen share for just a second. So we can see our answers here. And I'm hoping this is going to go real smooth. Okay, cool. Okay, so if you have a device, or if you want to get on using your browser, you go to menti.com and use the code 35, 34, sorry, 0514. And I would like to know for you, what comes to mind when you think of self-regulated learners? 
Okay, so I'm going to leave this up here for just about a minute, and I'd like you to answer and throw in some one word answers, some longer answers. Just what comes to mind when you think of self regulated learners? So, independent determination, disciplined, very nice. Mature, efficient. Some great words coming in. Mm -hmm. It's fun to watch them change. I'm like, what's going to happen next? Oh, boy. <laughs> Very nice. Planner. Good. Give it about 30 more seconds. Self starter. Okay, good. Intrinsically motivated. Very nice. So we can see through this determination, independent disciplines, there's a lot of really great words here that can describe self-regulated learners. And I agree with all of them. I think there's a lot of awesome things that self-regulated learners can achieve if they possess some of these, uh, some of these words or some of these descriptors or be able to um, self-regulate um, by uh, attempting um, to, you know, do different things with their work. I think it's important to understand that, you know, we have this great idea for self-motivated learners or self-regulated learners, but we also have to remember that, like, students can get to these points. This is a learned skill. It can be learned. It can be achieved if you can set up a way for them to be able to easily access and understand how they learn as learners. I never understood how I learned as a learner. I wasn't sure, I guess I had kind of a doubt with learning. I'd work on a project really, really hard, or I'd study for a certain amount of time. And sometimes I'd be honest with myself, like, no, I really didn't study. Or, yeah, I really did study. And sometimes, let's be honest, I didn't study. But a lot of the reasons was because I did not understand the process in, in order to regulate my actual learning. So I'm going to leave that up there, and you can continue to work on uh, adding stuff, you're welcome to. I'm going to go back to the presentation. Okay. So let's go back here. Okay. Oh, can we see the? Oh, very cool. Can you all see the um, presentation? Oh, awesome. Yes. Oh, that's so much easier. All right. Sorry. New to, uh, <laughs> new to some things here. <laughs> okay. So let's really quickly delve into our. Um, North Carolina Music Essential Standards. So we have three essential standards that we look at in our curricula. Music literacy, music response, and contextual relevance. Rele relevance. Then I have included another one here called power standards. And these power standards were something that Moore County Schools came up with when we first hit the COVID um, crisis in March. Now, what exactly is a power standard? Well, for Moore County and for when we were attempting to switch over everything we were told that we had to come up with some power standards essentially objectives and goals that related back to our larger standards our music literacy music response and contextual relevancy so from power standards i developed an idea and a concept behind understanding what our standards were taking what standards we have and streamline them to be effective in the use of time that we actually had with our students Back in March, we weren't actually allowed to require students to be in classes. So we had to be able to get creative when we were attempting to teach students and being able to um, essentially show them how to learn and how to approach um, music in a non-music classroom, an ensemble setting as a non-ensemble setting. These power standards became very, very important. We're gonna talk about objectives and goals um, later on in our presentation. So self-regulated learning, I want to direct your attention to this visual right here, is essentially a three-step process surrounded by reflection. 
So planning, monitoring, and evaluating as learners while reflecting on each section or each part of your learning process. So you plan one's learning. The student will plan how they learn, how they are successful within learning a concept, with achieving those goals, with uh, attempting those objectives. They're gonna learn how to monitor their own process while implementing the plan. How are they effectively going about it? What kind of roadblocks are they hitting? Is it a physical roadblock? Is it a emotional roadblock? Evaluating the outcome of the plan, self-testing, self-analyzing, if they actually learn that objective and being able to prove to you, the teacher, that they have learned an objective. And finally, reflecting. And this constantly happens throughout the cycle. Reflecting means asking themselves if they can actually you know, understand a concept or be able to attempt a concept. And then understanding what the issues are if they can't or where they went awry or where they went wrong with approaching the next objective. So self-regulated learning is the process of managing thoughts, emotions, and behaviors purposely to acquire information and skills. This relates very heavily to our SEL. And essentially there are eight steps within our planning, our monitoring, our evaluation, and our reflection. The first step is goal setting, long and short-term goals. How can students set their mind to something if they don't have a goal in mind for the short-term and for the long-term? And for teachers, we need to have those goals and objectives to see where they're going to be, where our students are going to be from day one to the end of the year, from day one to the end of the month, from day one until you go back to school, like actually are in the classroom again. Planning the steps that are needed to get to the goal. So encouraging students how to plan, how to plan their time, how to plan their um, emotions, how to plan their thoughts. Self-motivation. What gives your students motivation to actually do the work? Sometimes they'll phone it in, especially with what's on the computer in your home. And sometimes it's out of their control. I'm sure, and I know that for a fact that a lot of my students have siblings at home and parents have to work. So they have to watch their siblings, especially if they're younger. So having that motivation to get up and do that work when there's so much other stuff going on can be challenging. Attention control, the phone, right? Making sure that these kids can stay off those phones and stay off Instagram, stay off. I don't think they use Facebook anymore. Whenever I say Facebook, they call me Mr. Holt, you're so old. And it's like, I'm 27, I'm not the, you know, but <laughs> but they staying on there and, and making sure that they can stay on the computer and work or being able to um, keep their attention. Super, super important part of the eight step process. Flexible use of strategy. Ones that work individually for each student, right? What my learning strategy is for me might not necessarily be the same thing for you. I'm very kinesthetic. I can learn using my hands and taking notes, but that doesn't work for everybody. Monitoring their progress, help seeking, making sure they're reaching out to you if they have a question and you being accessible for those questions. And finally, self-evaluate. So, some students are successful at this. Some students can manage their time very well. Others, like myself, are certainly less successful at being that. And there are a few things that actually tell or that they believe um, that hurts them from being able to learn successfully. Sometimes they hold faulty beliefs, their ability, their learning and their motivation. They're unaware of the ineffective learning behavior. If you're trying to reach point A to point B, you wanna go in a straight line. But sometimes there are things that cause you to go in different directions or you to take a left turn when you should be going straight, right? So they might not be aware of how their ineffective learning behaviors are affecting their overall success. They fail to sustain effective learning and motivational strategies. They forget that certain things work for them and, and certain things don't. They're not ready for change and learning and they lack awareness. And that was the big thing for me is I lacked awareness of my thinking and being understanding how to control um, you know, where my thoughts were going sometimes when I was sitting in the classroom. So you want to develop academic self-regulation. It's not something that they know. I mean, some are probably very good time managers. I'm not going to broaden, but you need to encourage them to be um, successful with themselves and be confident with their learning. So motivation, methods of learning, the use of time. These are great tools 
and for you to understand how you can take your lessons and essentially give them the tools to be successful while they're on their own, when they're not being led by you. So we have to think of transfer of learning. So transfer of learning is essentially from step A to step B, right? We're going from, you know, objectives one, two, three to four, five, six within two weeks. If you think of the broad spectrum from high school to college, there's a huge shift from teacher-directed learning to student-directed learning, right? So I, it seems, you know, when, 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 and when I was in high school, uh, you know, my teacher was up in the front of the classroom teaching and telling us exactly what to do. When we got to college, they did the same thing, but there was a very heavy, you know, read three chapters, do this, do this, understand the material outside. So then when you come in, you're feeling more successful. That's how I handle my orchestras. The music making happens here, but the technical aspects and those, those things happen outside of the classroom to be able to come in and to work on the musicality. So it's influenced by metacognitive skills. High school music teachers that we're shifting over online and we're, we're, we're constantly battling with ensemble making. But if we try to focus on ensemble, it can become very, very challenging. So I'm encouraging my colleagues, I'm encouraging my students to start working on individual skills and specific students within the ensembles. So how do we help promote this? Well, in music, practicing habits and fundamental skills, and really in any discipline, if we practice our good habits, we practice our fundamental skills, we're gonna continue to establish really great um, uh, habits and really great practice routines, as long as we can guide them in that way. Now, I'm not saying we should tell them each individual step, but there should be a guidance to get them started. So for the sake of time, I'm actually gonna go ahead and skip through this, but this is something good to think about. So what's most important to you teaching virtual students? Um, and I want you to go ahead and answer in the chat. What are the most important things to you for teaching virtual students? While you do that, we'll continue to go on. So when you model student learning, Again, let's look back at this visual. Planning, monitoring, and evaluating happen with reflection. So if students can reflect upon each step or each part of their lesson, they'll be more successful at understanding what went wrong, what went really well, et cetera. So in the planning stage, we give students the ability to plan their learning over time. It's really key to kickstarting their learning. Setting those objectives and goals, make them minimal, don't overstimulate. Like it's like you guys having the big picture in front of you, you guys having the finished work of art, you guys having the score. You're not gonna give them every single piece and every single little detail to match those objectives or goals. It's gonna really overwhelm them. So if you can take those objectives, those five objectives and minimalize them for each week or even every two or three days to one objective and a small amount of goals that works, that's gonna give them the ability to start to set their own goals and set their own pace. It's kind of like choosing out of a bucket, right? You're, you have those objectives set. So what goals can they add to each objective each day or each week to successfully get to them? And that builds confidence in their planning. They're not gonna feel like they are going to, um, they're gonna fail by themselves. Like it's okay if they need more time. This is such a flexible time and it needs to be flexible. Us as teachers and students need to understand that flexibility is okay. So in the performing arts, SMART is the way I think. Specific, measurable, achieving, relevant, and timely goals. This gives them specific ideas upon how to set their own goals. So brainstorming with each other or brainstorming with you one-on-one -on -one to be able to set those goals and set those objectives in a SMART way. So being specific and being realistic with these goals in a timely manner is so, so important. It takes a little bit of work on your end at first, but once you find your lessons and once you find your objectives and you find those things, you can easily get them to understand how to think smart and how to move on um, between each goal and each objective. So here's an example I have for bow hold. My long-term goals are right here, holding the bow correctly, creating consistent tone, no collapsing of the fingers. And then I listed my short-term goals on the left-hand side. Now these goals, in, in the amount of time that they have, they're not gonna be able to do this all in one week. In fact, for beginners especially, the way I teach is our, my bow hold, my bow actually comes two or three weeks later than 
them actually holding the instruments. So for me to be able to successfully understand how they're going to approach the bow hold, I need to be flexible with my long-term and short-term goals. These are mine. So how can I develop these in their language to be able to get them to understand? Well, again, being specific. So look at this. I actually planned out a time versus a step-by-step -step process. So I would have them write down each day, okay, what they worked on, how long did they do it? Okay, that's okay. Did they do it or did they not do it? Um, which, which open strings did they use? Just being specific about what it is they're trying to write down helps so much. It helps them understand how to regulate their own learning and it helps you to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are. But always remember to reflect, remember to journal, remember to write down their thoughts or have them write down their thoughts so later on they can approach them and continue to uh, uh, go about each, each goal. Then we go to monitoring. Give students their ways to monitor progress, set checkpoints, give rewards, give bonuses, not just from you, but have them have a reward, right? So something that motivates me is sitting on my couch and not doing anything. So if I can get all my stuff done, it's a great time for me to just sit and relax. That's me. though. But students can actually develop their own goals by saying, OK, I'm going to get some video game time in today. Or maybe I'm going to go out and hang out with my friends. Social distance, but I'm still going to do it. OK, so those are the things that you can help um, with being able to monitor. So self-monitoring has a lot, again, reflects back to our SELs, understanding where they are each day. This is a great chart for them to see and like understand, OK, I'm not feeling great, too. I'm I'm not uh, you know I'm not feeling like I can practice today like that's okay if they understand how their emotional being is doing and how they are working that's what's most important and having a workspace set up the intention control the flexible use of strategies and self monitoring having a really good workspace set up for them or have to encourage them to be able to set up a great workspace will have them being able to focus a little bit more, especially if there's a lot of distractions in the home. Define your students' strategies, time management, social context, priorities, goals, outside work. This is for you to know. And then you can approach their learning and they can approach their learning with understanding of where their strengths and weaknesses are. Matthew, can I pipe in just for a second on yeah. that previous slide? Yeah. Um, so you can think about that, you know, even though this is a math example, but you can think about for each of your arts disciplines, you know, what would you suggest to really help them create a perfect workspace for them at home? Um, my children's art teacher gave them a list of things to create their own art space at home and, 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 and just how to create that with what they have already. Um, and I know a lot of dance teachers will give criteria of these are some things that you can take into consideration and look at it to find the best space in your home to dance. So doing something like that for your specific needs for your class um, is really, I think, a helpful thing to do and set up from the very beginning. OK, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. All right. So. Um, Again, another good way to look at this. Here's a, a really simple resource, personal math goals, how they'll reach their goals, and did they actually reach their goals? They defined their goals together. They defined exactly how they were going to approach them. And then it's a simple question. Did you meet that goal or did you meet, not meet that goal? It doesn't need to be complicated, but if you can show them the way to do it and to approach it, they're gonna have more success because they understand how to reflect upon their learning and how to, um, approach their goals in a more efficient way. Evaluating gives students their tools to evaluate their own progress, right? Test themselves, um, design their own ways of evaluating, right? Evaluation should be fun for them. Like they should be able to go into it and say, yeah, I can pick up on that real quick or do a flashcard and they'll, they can get excited about it. Don't give a simple bland, you know, evaluation that is, you know, that um, your students can, can work through relatively, I don't know, let them evaluate themselves. Let them understand how they can evaluate themselves. And by that way, you can then see how they're actually being reflecting on their own process. So in here's a, an example for our visual arts. We have a lot of visual arts. I actually really like this cartoon. I laughed really hard about it. And I just 
I, I, I loved it. So I don't know if any of you relate to this. Uh, I relate to this with my playing sometimes where I'm like, this sounds really good. And then I listen back to it and then I delete the recording. So um, I'm sure I'm sure we've had this this uh, these moments before. Another very simple um, resource right here. Again, you know, things that they learned. How did they evaluate their learning? Things that they liked about it. OK, to like something and not like something. Work on it. Keep developing it, especially with projects. You know, it's a long term process. So what can they continue to do? That works really well. What can they work on and improve constructive criticism and always leave room for journaling to ask questions for you so they can reflect off their own process. And finally, reflection, so it encompasses the entire phase again, they continue to go back and they continue to reflect, making it fun journaling sticky notes, creative colors. Um, crazy looking charts arrows things that like will get them excited about journaling. Right? It's kind of like a diary. It's a way for them to express their thoughts and feelings upon how they believe they're learning. And you can see it. If they're struggling, they're going to tell you. They're going to feel like, man, I just can't get this concept. Or if they're succeeding, they're going to tell you. And then you can work with them to define their own objectives and plans to reach, to, to get even um, farther within a, within a lesson. So an example here, remembering the eight steps. Asking these questions, these reflection questions are always going to be different, but these are great uh, starters to be able to uh, approach a reflection. So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and show you our um, SRL templates that I have for you. This is for you guys to um, approach and make into your own uh, into your own way. Um, so let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and click on it. So you'll notice that Google Docs pops up and all you have to do is click make a copy. And when you click make a copy, there you go. <laughs> you'll see that your template has popped up. This is an example for music, but this can easily be changed for your own discipline. If you'll notice, I actually include some colors, so I felt really proud of that. Um, each week is gonna be different, right? Each little each part of the student's plan is going to be different. So for example, for me, I have students work on warm ups, fundamentals, music, and then let them have fun to go out and try to explore new music. And it doesn't necessarily have to be playing. It could be listening to a new piece of music. It could be trying a new instrument, just things that will continue to keep them engaged and keep coming back. You can you can totally plan this around monitoring and rewards and you know as long as they're journaling and continue to 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 show you their progress this is a great tool for them each day is labeled objectives are on the side and goals this is actually great for teachers just to be able to you know write down their stuff their thoughts and feelings and reaches so thoughts and feelings very simple stuff so like how are you feeling sad or unmotivated or i'm doing okay they don't necessarily need to go and tell you a paragraph about their life. If it's one word things, you can get a lot from that. And then you can understand how they're doing each week. The reaches are kind of like, I want to be a classical, like I want to play Mozart. I want to do something that's like, you know, out of this world. And the reaches are great because then you could see the reaches and then you can start to plan their own objectives and their goals behind their reaches. Like if they really are motivated to get to something you can work with that student and really plan their own goals and objectives to reach that. And then here's some reflection templates for you. So on the left side of the Monday, I put some, just some buzz questions, just to get them thinking about how they did throughout the day, how they accomplished a goal, how they went about practicing it. Did they actually do it, right? So they can actually see what their progress has done. For example, when I eat fast food, I'm like, I haven't had fast food in like three weeks. And it turns out uh, I look at my credit card statement and I'm like, oh, I guess I had it like on Wednesday. So like it helps me to remember like when I did something and it's so beneficial because they got so much going on and it's good for them to understand um, where, where they are basically. So that is for you. You can design it your own way. You can brain it up. You can add some really cool pictures to it. But this is great to share with your students because then you can keep track of their progress each day. I'm going to turn it over to Sayward. Yes. 
Okay, yeah. So this is actually just an example that I used. Um, I had mentioned that I was teaching in the college setting. Um, last semester, I was actually teaching at three different universities, teaching dance classes when everything got sent home, right? And so I had to figure out how to still teach um, all of these technique classes and uh, college level courses, just like you all had to do with your classes. So I came up with this structure um, as a way for the students to sort of direct what their needs were and create their classes um, based on what they were more interested in. So we've seen like choice boards. It was similar to that choice board, except I, I really had them create a full class. So they went through the same structure each time. So if you'll look, um, the, the, they had to choose from each of these categories. They would pick their concept focus. So you could adapt this for any any arts area, um, but I gave them a list of elements, you know, based on which level they were in or what the focus of the class was, whether it was ballet or modern or even dance pedagogy, right? So then the elements or the concepts that I really wanted them to choose from, I gave them those and then they would write out their goals for the day or, or for the week. What were their goals? What did they want to work on? Um, and really taught them how to write those specific goals out. Um, they also used these later for their assessment points and I had them write their own assessment points as well of what they wanted to be assessed on. Um, they then would choose their warm up, but I also gave them the option of journaling um, to do almost a mental warm up first. So they could choose from, you know, yoga or somatic uh, warm ups, improvisational tasks, floor bar. Um, I gave them a whole series of sample videos that I had I had physically done all of them and found them or videos of me leading them through something or a written description. So de again, depending on the class, I created this, this um, list that they could choose which of those they wanted to start with. And that also included if you wanted to do 10 minutes of a free write or journaling or even go on a walk, a nature walk, right? And so we started to kind of rethink um, what, what is ballet? It's a way of organizing our body, our mind, our emotions, right? And so how are we going to kind of restructure the way that we normally see ballet at the bar and now we're going to include our environment and and where we are and what we're actually feeling um, each day at home so task two they would dive more into the fundamentals or skills of whatever focus concept they chose so they might start with a full at home bar or they might do center exercises. Again, I had video options that they could choose directly from, um, but I also gave them the option to create their own um, if they wanted to do that. If they wanted to do more of an exploration task, then they could do that as well. Um, the third one, they went a little bit deeper with this concept so they could use choreographic tasks and create a phrase. Um, or a, a presentation. They could do some alternate type of project. So I would get photography projects and video projects. I would get visual art related to that dance concept. Um, or they could watch a documentary that might be about a famous um, dancer or choreographer or something along that those lines. And then finally, at the end of um, the week, they would do a reflection. So I saw these students three days a week, they could repeat the same class structure all three days so that they could really refine what they were focusing on and working on so that by the end of the week, they will go through their list of reflective questions and um, really, really think about what did they get from this experience? And I'll be honest with you, I sometimes had students that said I could not physically dance this week or move because of either emotions or illnesses or just lack of space. So I gave them a non movement option and series of documentaries that were all grouped based on a particular theme. So it's a lot of legwork right from the very beginning to set all of these up, but then it makes it really efficient for the student to kind of find their flow and be able to go through week to week um, and see that the scaffolding is really based on what they're putting into it. Um, so they're really creating creating that um, through line themselves. 
So I, I gave this to you just as that that little example that you can come back to. You can take it and create it, um, you know, adapt it to whatever you would like. We'll move on to the next slide and I'll go through just a few quick examples here of um, another thing that you can do. And this can be in any class online or face to face. Um, I, I've done with this with my students in the classroom as well, but from the very beginning of the semester, let them help with brainstorming short and long term goals for the course. And they can do that in any of these apps, you know, answer garden. They can start to put in what their goals are. You find what those common goals or themes for the course are, and you'll find that they really align with the standards, but the students are the ones coming up with the language that makes sense to them. So you can then start to word those and put those into phrasing and the class has really determined what their objectives are. And then you as the teacher say, well, yeah, that's actually this standard right here that we're covering and that's this standard. And so then um, it's in a language that really makes sense to them and they have ownership. I did this also with creating rubrics and performance assessments as well, where we would choose, you know, our 10 points that we wanted, we felt like were most important for a project and what they wanted to be graded on and assessed on. So that's another example. Next slide. Here are um, a few additional examples of journals. Um, and Matthew, if you'll click on that first um, example journal right there. This is one that was created for college students, but it can very easily be adapted to high school, middle school, and you can just take this concept to even adapt for elementary, but obviously modify, simplify. If you'll just scroll down, Matthew, this this um, dance professor created this for anybody to be able to use, but if you scroll through it, she's got this template that you can print or or just type directly on it. There you go. So she's got each week with various goals or questions that they can put into their journals. Um, and I did something similar to this. I didn't have this template, but I used um, we used Moodle, and I would just use the journal format directly in our our LMS there. And each week I would put prompts and the students could just write their journal entries directly into that. And so I could keep track of them and read them. And so you can really give them, um, you know, these different uh, questions to be thinking about and writing um, with their with their journaling that can be before or after class. So it's really depending on how you want to frame it. But it goes through, it gives you examples of week by week and then mid semester and at the end of the semester. Um, so you could really take this and just transform it into something that would really work more specifically for you, but it's a great, great example. Um, there's another one there for visual art and then there's one for theater art. And these are these are slightly different, but they definitely give you those um, examples of reflection questions that you can adapt or modify for your own age groups. Um, and then that bottom one, that theater arts one is a self assessment that it actually includes a checklist. So um, there's lots of great information there. We can move on to the next. Slide. And Brandon, so, can talk about this one. Yeah, I was going to say Sayward and Matthew have talked a lot about secondary teaching in middle school and high school. Um, and so I. Um, wanted to speak a little bit to the elementary school since that's what I spent most of my uh, time teaching. And so, um, you know, if we're trying to get kids ready to do this idea of self-regulated learning in middle or high school, then we need to think about the broader 12 year gradual release model, right? So in the younger grades, we're leading this, but as they get into upper elementary, we should have them or sorry, middle elementary, we should be doing this as a group and com coming up with group goals and group steps. And then as we're getting into fourth and fifth grade, maybe when they're doing their recorder units, you know, they're setting their own goals and, and their own practice plans in order to get there. Um, have Having students choose short-term goals from a limited amount of goals that you've already curated, you know, um, making sure that they're attainable and realistic when you only see kids for 
30 minutes, 36 times a year, if there's no snow days, assemblies or fire drills during their class, you know, we have to make sure something's realistic. And sometimes we don't have even time to talk to them about what that looks like. So maybe we present them with a short list of 20 holes. Um, tornado drills, yep, that too. <laughs> have students go ahead and set their long-term goals at the beginning of the year, you know, at the and and say like, hey, I want to be on America's Next Top Model or Next Top Model, America's Got Talent. So sorry, um, and uh, you know, and and reference that, like, hey, remember, like, this is your goal. This is how we get here. Um, and then providing students with time and structures, aka. Work, familiar worksheets, familiar settings to actually reflect and self-evaluate is going to be super important. So I've got some of those on the next slides. I know it's four o'clock. We will go through these last two slides very quickly. Um, so right here on uh, slide 54, you guys have a whole bunch of just Link City um, here for general practices, um, visual art, theater, and dance here. So these are all sort of secondary. The next slide is music. We knew that Matthew was really speaking to music, so we, we didn't go as in depth on this one. And then the next slide um, really speaks to just setting SMART goals for elementary school students, and then some ideas and reflective practices for elementary school students. I love free things, so I linked to free things, but know that you can you can, you know, go on teachers pay teachers and and just have a ball if you really want to. Um, and the last page or the next slide, excuse me, um, is just an example, something that I did all the time with my students before as we were just starting getting ready for a show. We came up with a rubric. What does the audience do if our show is awesome? What do performers do? What do they sound like? What do they look like? And then we reference that every single week. And then at the end, we watched a recording and we graded ourselves on that exact same rubric. So they're building um, their own structure of a goal and how to get there. And then they're doing that self evaluation as well. All right. So, um, if you can, or if, yeah, I was gonna say, we're gonna have to skip this too, <laughs> if you can go forward. Um, so say word, I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Um, oh, let me find my page, sorry. Okay, so that brings us to our closure for today's session. Remember that we have recorded this and we will be uploading the recording to our webinar archive and you have a slot a copy of the slide deck to go back to at any point. We really encourage you to utilize all of those resources and um, dive through them. Even if it's not your art area uh, or content area, you can get a lot of ideas from looking at the other ones and see how you can adapt or modify for your own needs. The next slide, just take a moment to put in the chat very quickly, what's got you excited today? What are you gonna try to do now? Type some ideas and share with your peers. You can also share um, specifically remote learning ideas or, or lesson ideas in this um, shared Google Doc here, um, or sorry, that's a form, and then you'll get taken to the ideas that you wanna check out in the next um, link there. But go ahead and put some of your things that you're excited. We love to hear these and see these, getting my students involved in their, setting their goals use these for myself and my students. That's really important. And I found that very beneficial as a teacher as well. Um, well, actually, I even found a resource that maybe I'll link to in the follow-up email. Um, somebody was asking if they're getting the, um, the chat log. And yes, the chat log does record as well. And some people were asking about electronic ways to um, journal. And if you are using, um, Google Classroom, Canvas, Moodle, any of those, you can actually set up a discussion forum that's private and only you and the student can see it. So that's a fantastic, super easy way to do a journal. And I actually loved doing the, the private journals, but then I would also occasionally post discussion board chats for the students to get um, involved sharing with each other. Sometimes it would be small groups, sometimes it was the whole class, um, and they really start to open up and share things um, that they're learning and they're dealing with. Um, it's really helpful. 
I love seeing all these things here in the chat put more of the learning in the students' hands, which takes the load off of the teacher. Yes, stress reducing, um, lots of ideas for giving students a voice and choice in their learning, very important. Um, creating a clear structure for setting goals, getting students to do the work and enjoy it. Um, creating clear structures for reflection and setting goals. Amazing, amazing stuff here. So we're going to go ahead. You can keep sharing your ideas. I'm going to go ahead and post the link to the survey here. Oh, Brandon's got wow, it. I just did it. Yep. So he's got the link to the survey there. If you um, make sure you go to that link and fill out the survey, then you will receive a link. Um, uh, or sorry, you will also receive a link to this in your follow up email, but you'll get a confirmation that you've completed your survey and that's where you go to find your certificate. You need to make sure that you go in and save it once you get that confirmation. That's how you'll get your certificate for credit for attending today's session. And then lastly, thank you so much for attending today's session. Our emails are here one more time for you. Please feel free to reach out if you need anything. If you have further questions or want to brainstorm solutions or ideas for your classroom or any specific situation that you have. We um, also love when people have ideas for collaborating with us. If you would like to collaborate on a session to help other arts educators, we love hearing from you and working with you. And we hope to see you at um, the remainder of our future webinars. Take care and have a great rest of your day and happy planning. We will stay on for just a couple more minutes. Um, you are free to go. Uh, if you do have any other questions, you can type them in the chat or you can feel free to just um, unmute and ask them away. We will stay on for a couple more minutes for you. I have stopped the live stream. Excellent, thank you. Ooh, that's nice. I like that idea. I want to put some of these in the meeting notes for sure. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but we'll go ahead and stay on. Okay. Um, if you see some